Thank you. All right. Does anybody here love Shark Tank? Thank you. All right, so we are so honored to have you here. I'm personally such a huge fan of the show. I, I watch it all the time. It's one of the few things that I actually tune into. Thank um, you. I want to actually start by uh, rewinding a little bit. Sure. And thinking back to your early days at FUBU and understanding what it was like to be an entrepreneur. And I want to know, if you were placed in the Shark Tank, one year into FUBU, who would you be going after to get a deal, aside from yourself, Right. and what would be the pitch? Ooh, tough. Um, well, first of all, one year after starting FUBU, I, I, I closed it three times after that, because um, I ran out of money. So I would say the appropriate time for me to walk into the tank would have been right around my sixth year in FUBU. I was still working at Red Lobster, but I had already known that the, the company was starting to get traction. I think knowing the Sharks now personally, the one I would have went uh, for, um, believe it or not, would have been Barbara. Because I think that Barbara, Barbara has a, a fascinating way of cutting through the truth and still, as we just saw, you know, um, I think name Peter talk about is customer service and understanding what people really want, what motivates them. Uh, Mr. Wonderful wouldn't have been great. I want no royalty crap from him. Uh, <laughs> you know, Robert's too pretty. You know, Cuban would have been cool, but he's a know-it-all. Um, I'm happy to see that this... The, the banter that happens on the show oh, actually no, it's, it's real. transcend the show. Nah, those, those guys are idiots. <laughs> now, um, Barbara would have been probably it. But I don't know if FUBU would have been the cool hip brand with old crusty Barbara on the side. I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter. So you ran out of money three times? Yeah. In the first six three years? Three times from 89 to 92, I ran out of capital. But the important thing about, uh, for the people that in, this, in this room to understand is I ran out of capital, but I only ran out of $1,000 and $5,000. I didn't take out the $100,000 loan until I actually had $300,000 in orders. People think they need to do that, but the number one reason why small businesses fail is they actually fail because of overfunding. They take out too much too soon. Mm -hmm. So what did you do in between then? You basically you went back to work at Red Lobster to get more money and... Yeah, you know what, and today, you know, of course, I, I want to talk, because uh, it's hard to, there's a room here of brands and then there's, um, you know, or, or big companies and then there's individuals, right? And I want to really talk to the brands itself because if I can talk to them, then they can power, the, they can understand more about the individual influencers in the room. Um, but. Uh, you know, I think what, what drove me is the fact that of all these influencers, I was doing something that I really was passionate about, and when I stopped, people would come back to me and said, I bought a shirt from you last year, Where, what's up? When are you gonna do this again? And I, it, it, the business called me back, unlike when I was trying to do things for money and I never made money. Hmm. So it called me back the same way somebody can just start doing a beatbox at home and all of a sudden, McDonald's is, is, is going to them. And it's just really authenticity. That's what drove me back to the business. And we, when we talk about brands and building a brand, you've been dubbed the, the people shark. Yeah. Um, where did that come from? And, and how does that drive you as you look at your role at Shark Tank? Well, because you know, we're in the day and age of the consumer is no longer like, uh, what have you done for me lately? It's what have you done for anybody lately when they talk to a brand? Uh, these uh, millennials, as or any consumer, they don't need to buy anything. You're never going to create anything new in this world again. It's only going to be a new form of delivery, a new audience that you hit. So if you're a brand, these kids are, and adults are looking through you going, what have you done for anybody lately, or are you just doing this for money? And as I got onto the show, I realized many, you know, only like five years ago that everything I've done in my life even though I wanted to make money, it's always been what I felt for other people. Forest Bias was created for a community, not a color, but it was a community that was being ignored by, by brands, right? Um, my first book, Display of Power, was the power that you have inside of you. And now I'm on Shark Tank, uh, it, it's about empowering people. So I, people started calling me the people shark because the only time I ever get irritated on the show is when somebody's up there, they're trying to raise a million dollars, they've already raised $10 million, 
they're trying to exploit the platform and they're just trying to show off. Meanwhile, they took that opportunity from a hardworking mother or dad who leveraged everything. They've done everything they could with $50,000 $50, and all they need is an opportunity. So I get mad at the people who try to exploit the platform and then people started calling me the people shark because I really wanted to help pull other people up the ladder. So did that, did that name come from social media then? People watching the show and... It, it did come from social media, you're right. It did come from social media because, you know, we, were, we, we are the first uh, show to start doing live tweeting. Mark Cuban had realized that the show was the top show watched kids from 5 to 15 years old and parents and kids together. And we started doing live tweeting and we started to understand how this, uh, you know, the second screen started to light up as we call it, uh, you know, during yeah. commercials. Yeah. It became the first screen. And we started to then push our information out through there, what you weren't seeing on the tank. And then my dialogue, I guess, you know, people started saying, oh man, you're like the people shark. Um, yeah. And I think that's how we started to, to look at it and start to push the name out and, and embrace it. So were you big, were you a big social media user prior to the Shark Tank? Or did that really kind of make you realize what the amount of power that that platform had. Well, I mean, I think I was growing every single day, but I was using it first um, because I I have a lot of young people at my office who were who were telling me the advantages of it, mm -hmm. and I was going through it at first when I was consulting. Let's say for, I was consulting for a big chicken company, and they wanted to get in. They wanted they wanted to catch up to their new partner, to the new competition, and I said to them, well, what kind of campaign you want to run? They were they wanted to kind of run all these other campaigns, but I said the problem with your brand is everybody thinks your chicken is has steroids in it. So before you try to sell anything new to them, you have to take this stink off of your brand. Mm -hmm. I started to do it as well with FUBU. You know, we started to hashtag FUBU, and instead of the people who like FUBU, we wanted to hear what people were saying who didn't like FUBU. And we started to realize that people were talking about FUBU going either we sold the company, we only made baggy jeans, or the product we had out was crap. So we had to educate them that we didn't sell the company. We were making form-fitting tight clothes in Europe from day one. It was the American hip-hop kids that only wanted the baggy jeans. And we didn't put anything in the market in the last 10 years, so anything you're seeing right now was 10 years old. If you look at Louis Vuitton 10 years, old, 10 years ago, picture you in that, it still looks dated. And we yeah. had to change that mindset. So I was looking through social media and we were active with it so we can understand what to do with our brand personally and for the brands that I was working with. So does that now become an active part um, from, from the show's perspective? Are you guys looking at social media as a platform that's really integrated with each show? Like you, you have an idea before a show airs what you're going to be talking about and, and how you're going to be trying to engage audience to get more discussion around the, the platform? Uh, we, we do a little bit of that, but we more look at the data afterwards and see how we can improve uh, the next uh, form of communication we put out there. And then we do it for all the brands we work with, you know, such as obviously with you. And, um, and, and we, you don't hear about focus groups anymore. Right? You don't need them. You don't need them, right? <laughs> They're happening all, all around us. It, it, it's, it's all there. So we do it in all aspects of what we do with Shark Tank and personal brands. And, I, and, I do, and my team does it with myself as well. You know, you'll look at somebody like, I was having a, a discussion with somebody about a, a recent uh, a commercial Usher did about two years ago, three years ago, and he did it when he was, you know, in the BMW and looking all cool, right? But it, as an artist or an influencer, who is your real brand, right? So there's a couple of Ushers, right? There's uh, Usher the singer, Usher the, 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 the sex symbol, Usher the rich guy, Usher the dad. And if you're doing a commercial with Usher and you're talking about the sexy woman you like, right? And you're in a BMW, those people aren't buying your, your stuff. But if you looked at a woman and she was walking out with two kids and going, and you were talking to a guy about how beautiful and sexy this woman is, the 35-year-old woman was the one who fell in love at 20 years old to Usher's music. Yeah. She's going to be the one that's going to buy your product. So you need to go about the automobile that is appropriate for her because she's sharing your content and loves you 10 times more than the guy who cares if you're sexy or has, has jewelry, right? So you have to really analyze who you're real customer is. And I know that, believe it or not, people think, oh, I'm the FUBU guy, this and that. I've been on ABC for eight years. My core customer is a 60-year-old middle American white woman. That's my customer. <laughs> Shout out to white women. That's my customer. <laughs> All the white women in the audience. <laughs> yeah. But you got to understand who your customer is. That's fantastic. So. 
dovetailing that into the, the deals that you look at, you know, whether it's through the Shark Tank platform or I know that you do just a, a lot of mentoring in, in yeah. general, how important is a social media presence and their active monitoring of, of what their customer is saying as you look at a deal? You know, yeah. I, I actually hear that come up in the show where people will be like, We've got a million followers on YouTube. Does that does that matter? Is that a proof point in one way or the other? Well, uh, you know, we we know that quant, uh, quality is more than quantity. So it is extremely important that we know that our our new invest, investments have some level of technology and or social media conversion. Because right now, with retail closing every single day, you can't depend on that. Right now, with the fact of membership programs and things of that nature, and you get full margin selling directly to your customer, and you get full feedback, it's extremely important. If I wasn't on Shark Tank, I probably learned the most than anybody else. As much as I joke about the sharks, I learn from them, but I learn from these new kids coming up doing business a whole nother way. You know, I, if I wasn't on Shark Tank, I would have been still doing the same thing. Designing a shirt, maybe Macy's buys it, maybe the, the, the kid who's on Instagram all day at Macy's with the pimples on his face looking for a girlfriend, maybe he'll take it out of the, of the back room and put it on a rack, and the woman who buys it or the man or son who buys it, who bought it? Why didn't they buy it? Did they like it? Did they not like it? They bought it for themselves. I would have no knowledge of this. Now, you know exactly who bought the product. You know, you know that it's a, you know, a, a guy in Detroit, 30 years old, loves dogs, red cars, has, bad, has chronic halitosis and dandruff. You know that that person bought it. So now I gotta sell him something to wash your hair with too, right? At that. Yeah. But that is the most important part. You have to have social media uh, ability. And I learned a lot from, say, Brian from The Honest Company. Honest Company is doing amazing with Brian and Jessica Alba and Rich, and they're doing amazing jobs online. But They'll look and they'll realize that something is selling more in Orlando than someplace else. They'll call their stores and they'll replace the goods with what is selling better in that territory. So they'll also support retail from that side, but it all starts with the fact of social media conversion. So you're in a unique situation in that you, know, you are working with companies, they have their own brands, and you yourself are our major brand, right? Yeah. And we've worked together on, on programs with technology companies in particular who are really interested in tapping into the, the entrepreneurs who are really inspired by you. And um, we've had the, the pleasure of doing a couple deals together, but you've also passed on way more deals than, than the deals that we've done. Right. Um, and I, I know that you're very discerning when it comes to greenlining something versus saying, eh, not a, not a good fit. How do you make that call? Because the, the people that the brands that do want to work with you are willing to pay you substantial sums of money. Yeah. And you're willing to say, I'll take a pass. Well, I think that first of all, as we've gotten to know each other, you present them even though you know that I may not want to uh, you know, do it because you, you say to the brands, I know you've said to them plenty of times, hey, he probably not interested, but I'll, but I'll put it on his desk. Um, and don't get me wrong, it's not because I financially am secure and things of that nature. You know, the sharks and us, we all have a passion. We, anything we do, we, we overdo. So you look at Mark Cuban, he's in Sketcher commercials. He's one of, whatever resonates with him, right? I want brands that will empower the people we're talking to. Um, and it makes sense. And they're giving value to them. And a lot of times with the brands, um, the challenge they have is they say, hey, uh, Ted, I really like Damon John, and here's the messaging, and we, and we go, but you like him for the messaging he puts out. Why are you trying to alter this message? Yep. Let's approve the message he's going to put out to make sure it doesn't hurt your brand, but you want this authentic voice. You want to keep it real, argument's sake, right? And, and that's the biggest thing. How do we keep it real? And I find out, I find that half the brands get it and half go, no, well, listen, we're just trying to spend our money. We, just, we need to get this off of our books, and the, here is the, here is the uh, you know, communication. And it just doesn't work with me. But you know, I don't want them to feel like we don't want to work with people. We love working with brands. It's just that it has to be authentic. Yeah, and you've got, because of your profile, you're in very high demand, right? And yeah. so you can't, you got to balance. What do I take? You do, because you, 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 you don't want your followers to have sales fatigue. Yeah. You don't want to be pitching something every two minutes to them. I mean, after that, they're going to say, well, what are you doing this for? Right? So we look for brands that really work. And honestly, few brands get it. So like, I'll give you an example. You know, 
we're, we're on ABC, we're on Shark Tank. It's, it's, it, everybody, no matter what, has to address financial literacy and the ability to grow their business. You think an H&R Block calls me or you think uh, anybody with financial instruments call me? They don't call. They usually use stupid ass celebrities that nobody get, nobody <laughs> understands. No disrespect. I mean, and some of these celebrities are my friends, and I'm not mad at them for getting a check. Yeah. But if, but if, 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 if financial, uh, or if insur insurance companies always use actors, why wouldn't they use people who understand the value of insurance and protecting your assets? Why wouldn't H&R uh, Block or whoever these people are use people who told you the value of taxes before you end up in jail? You understand what I'm saying? So a lot of brands, they, they just don't get it. And I stopped advising brands for years. I, 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 was, I was managing the product integration of the Kardashians for their first four years. I walked all three girls around to all my friends in the fashion district. Some of them were creating you know, brands. And I, I promised them the girls would wear all their clothes, all three of the girls, for $75,000 the first year. That's Some of my deal. friends just called me two years ago and said, hey, I got $75,000 for the girls. Are you stupid? I can't even, they won't even pick up the phone for $75,000 now. Yep. Brands are so late all the time. Yeah, I remember we did, uh, we did our first tweet with Kim Kardashian in 2009, and it was $10,000, and people were like, $10,000? Are you crazy? For a tweet? That would be unheard of. Today. That's why in the first three years, they're all wearing my brand Kooji because yeah. I was like, screw you. You ain't going to pay them, then I'll pay them. Here you go. <laughs> so you spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs, and obviously, I mean, that's what you live and breathe. How do you think the definition of what an entrepreneur has, is has changed over the years? Uh, I think that's a good question. I don't think I've been asked that before. So. You know, entrepreneurship is not new. We've been bartering and trading since the beginning of time. This country was created off of it. But everybody used to think maybe 10 years ago, the entrepreneurship is this, I want to build a billion dollar brand. And no, it's not, it's not that any longer. It's, I want to build a great podcast, you know, that can just uh, educate people and empower myself. So the brands are being splintered now. You know, it's like when I grew up, you know, there, was, there were three stations, ABC, C, uh, CBS, and NBC. Now there's 300 stations, and it's the same exact thing happening with brands and entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are each individual now um, who are, can have a business doing as little as, and it's not little, but $100,000, and you're, you're putting $70,000 in your pocket. So um, it's just being very splintered, and each indep independent person is becoming a brand and an entrepreneur, and they're realizing that now. So how do you compete with all that fragmentation? I guess that, that's the question. It's like, how do you yeah. stand out as an entrepreneur, as somebody who may be a creator who's doing their own little podcast or they're making, you know, honey, yeah. right? How do I actually even get to that $100,000 level? Yeah, so, you know, it's, this, it's a secret, honestly, that almost every successful person knows and we've been holding it back from the entire world on how to become successful. <laughs> we haven't. I mean, most of us have been doing that. You gotta bust your ass. That's it. You gotta Amen. wake up before everybody, go to sleep after everybody, keep it real 100%, never quit, and bust your ass. That's it. You have to bust your ass. That's it. There's no secret. Everybody thinks there's a secret. You have to bust your ass. And you have to fail and fail and fail and fail and keep busting your ass. Oh, I love that. You ever, have you ever read the book, The Secret? I have. You have, and they're like, if you keep thinking about the bicycle, you'll get the bicycle. Isn't like, it, this, <laughs> there's no difference. Think and Grow Rich is about desire and drive. The Secret is about uh, meditating and everything else. Mark Cuban's book, uh, Will to Win, Minds, The Power of Broke, Go Bust Your Ass, Robert Hershebeck, Driven. We keep saying the same shit to everybody, and they keep walking up to me going, yo, why don't you tell me how to be rich, man? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. <laughs> so, in your book, The Power of Broke, you talk about the fact that throwing money at a problem is, is not going to fix it. Correct. So, what, what typically does fix the problems that entrepreneurs and, come up and, with? And it's very hard to say without a nice fluffy answer, but it is, it is rolling up your sleeves and getting into the business. And I'll, and I'll explain The Power of Broke. Uh, I learned the value of the power of broke more when I had money, when I acquired a company called Heatherette. I put $6 million into advertising, marketing, these great um, uh, fashion shows, and $6 million later, I lost, you know, I lost the money because 
you know, I'll, I'll tell you why. Heatherite was a, is a brand that was uh, ran by two really amazing uh, designers named Richie Rich and Trevor Rain. They had all these great uh, fashion shows. Everybody would go on the show. Like, Naomi Campbell would walk for free. Kamora Lee Simmons would walk the show for free. And these women charge $150,000, $200,000. When they finally got backed by me, of course, people wanted to get paid. Now, you and I, every man in the world can, we, there's two sizes to a 32, 34, 36. It's 32 regular, 32 long. A woman's body, there's 17 sizes or 18 sizes to every one size. So if a woman wears a six, there's a six with the, 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 the butt gap, so the thigh's too big, the thigh's too small, the, you know, whatever the case is. So there's about 17 sizes to a size six. And a woman will not buy a pair of jeans unless it makes her hiney look fantastic, right? Now, what we found out is these guys, they were great costume designers, and they weren't great ready-to-wear people. So they'll take Naomi Campbell, put an ace bandage on her all the way down to her ankles, spray paint her, put a garbage can on her head, and push her out on the runway. She'll look great, but they couldn't make everyday clothes fitted like that. I didn't learn that lesson until six million dollars late because I didn't put my ass at the sewing machines with them and realize what was going on. So I lost that money. Also, when FUBU started to decline, I would keep spending money and buying more ads, but I was buying into the curve instead of going back out there and seeing what was happening. So I learned that no matter how big you are as a brand or how small you are, you have to go in there and roll up your sleeves every day and be there. You got to try on those women's jeans. You have, you know, you have to have your <laughs> wife do it. You have to have a wife. My wife never tried them on at the time. And she said to me, why didn't you ask me? I was yeah. like, I didn't think about it. So you talk about busting your ass, you talk about the fact that you've gone broke multiple times, you run out of money. What drives you? Like, what gives you this hunger for success? Why can't you just sit back? I, I can, um, but you know, I've learned that we're at, a, we're at an amazing time in our lives and things are changing drastically with the technology. And um, I, learned, I, I realized that over the last five years or even the next five years, I need to know the fundamentals of what's going on so I can apply it to my life. You know, at the end of the day, I'm 47 years old and I'm most likely, I don't know how to do anything else. I love business. I'm gonna probably do this till I'm 70, 80, 90, in some form or another. Even if I retire and everything I'm gonna do is a nonprofit to stop human trafficking or something of that nature, I still need to know all of this stuff that's going on. And if I don't know these fundamentals of this crucial time that things are changing, then I'm not, I'm gonna be so left behind 10 years from now and 20 years from now, and I see it with my colleagues in the industry every single day. Um, but I do see the different colleagues out there who are practicing innovation, bringing millennials into their company and realizing that mentors don't need to be older. Sometimes it's reverse mentorship. They need to be younger. And the ones that change are just like me. They always are learning. And it, you never stop learning. There's no level of success that's a name, a price, the size of a house or an education. You never stop learning, and that's why I do it. I love what I do. So at what point do you know that you've had some level of success, right? Yeah. I, I think if, from what I hear from entrepreneurs a lot of times, it's like, you know, when did you know that, that you hit it? And I'm like, I, I, I am not successful yet. There's people yeah. I look up to that I say, oh man, that, that guy's successful, or that, that woman is successful. Yeah. Where, where do you feel you are in that curve? I, I agree, I feel that I'm successful, but it's not, it's not because of money, it's because uh, you know, I went through this curve, I was successful, uh, my businesses went down, I then came back and did them again, and, and, and it kept going, and I feel that hopefully I'm successful because I've tried to, because I've been blessed, I've been trying to educate people, and hopefully I've changed one or two or, or three people's lives, and, and I can consider myself successful there. And I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not up at night wondering how much more money I can make. And trust me, I got a decent amount of money, but I always say if Mark Cuban woke up with my money, he would blow his brains out. <laughs> so, you, you know what I mean? There's no number, and I always say if Bill Gates woke up with Mark Cuban's money, he'd blow his brains out. <laughs> so it's not, success is not money, and I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have my health, and I have, you know, three girls, three daughters, and stuff like that. So, I'm sorry, I am successful, but, but to answer one part of your question, on my rise, I probably have only felt successful in the last maybe four or five years, but on my rise, I've always had this healthy paranoia that I'm gonna lose it all. I'm going to lose it all. So, and it's a healthy paranoia that people should have. Don't get too comfortable. So when you were at your lowest of lows, how did you pick yourself up? 
At my lowest of lows was when I lost my, uh, I got divorced and I lost my family at that point and I realized that I was hanging out, partying too much and things of that nature. Um, I picked myself back up by realizing that what I was doing was trying to live up to what I thought success meant. That meant a bunch of cars, hanging out with all my celebrity friends and when I turned around and realized that, going back to authenticity, that I wanted to go and start educating people, I, I wanted to, I never wanted to be a, TV star, whatever you want to call it. I wanted to be like a newscaster. I wanted to share information. I went and I started going to Donnie Deutsch and CNBC, and the, here's the reason why. I grew up with a lot of celebrities. I grew up in Hollis, Queens. LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, Run DMC, all these people. And I used to see them being harassed. So I said to myself, if I'm gonna be a newscaster, nobody harasses a newscaster. Nobody says, Walter Cronkite, look at these. Nobody, <laughs> nobody does that, right? So I said I want to be a newscaster. I started going to Donnie Deutsch and CNBC, and then all of a sudden, because I wanted to educate people, all of a sudden, what happens? Mark Burnett calls. And he goes, I have the show with five business people. I go, nobody wants to see five business people talk crap and all that stuff. And I said, all right, I'll do this stupid show called Shark Tank, whatever it is. Now, all of a sudden, look where I'm at, right? But what happened was I lost everything, and I said to myself, I'm not happy. I have all the money in the world. I have celebrity friends. I'm partying. What am I going to do that makes me happy? And it was somewhat trying to empower people and give back. And what happened when I started doing that? Nobody can foresee the fact that Shark Tank being what it is. Boom, my career started again. It happened exactly when I started FUBU. I wasn't happy trying to do things for money. I just wanted to make these t-shirts. And I just kept at it. And then all of a sudden, boom. It always happened when I just did exactly what I was super passionate about. So if we could rewind back, say, 21-year-old Damon, sitting on the couch here, what would you tell him? I would say, Damon, you have to first of all have financial intelligence because no matter what, I don't care if you're just balancing a checkbook at home or you have a massive company, you need to know how numbers work, number one. Um, number two, you have to surround yourself with amazing individuals that have the same goals in mind and every single one of them need to know where their position are in the company. Number three, Please take affordable steps on anything you're doing. Just try a little bit, try a little bit, learn, and then repeat it. And then when, it, when you've mastered what you think it is, then you can bring in investments or bring in other people or expand it because you've ensured the way that it's going to scale. Um, do your homework. Uh, he said it earlier today, uh, the guy talking about um, the, who was it? Um, uh, the guy right after the air guitar guy. Anyway, Peter. Peter, <laughs> Peter yes, Peter, I mean, I'm back to you have to do your homework. Google is your friend. You will never create anything new in this world again. Listen, Uber is still a limousine service. Airbnb is still timeshare. And if you think that the Snuggie is not a blanket with holes in it, you're crazy. <laughs> it's just nothing new. What is new? There is nothing new. Facebook is a nasty chain letter. <laughs> it is. Everyone, we are out of time. Damon John, thank you. thank you so much. The People Shark, thank that you. was amazing. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank this you, everybody. This guy right here. Appreciate it.